Greetings from Los Angeles. Welcome to JamPlay.com. My name is Stuart Ziff. And welcome to week nine of my series, uh, our series here at JamPlay, since we're all one big happy family, um, called Tools and Techniques. And this is a, a, a series, if you've been here every week or you've been following things somewhat, you'll know that uh, this has been really geared towards the blues and and learning how to play better blues and learning learning the aspects that make blues what it is make blues guitar what it is and why it's important and uh, the things that we need to know the, the the basics the fundamentals that we need to know to play good blues and just to recap for you what we've talked about um, uh, beginning with week one it was all about rhythm guitar and um, every week I've mentioned the word rhythm in what I'm doing. Um, and there's going to be some talk about it in there today, as a matter of fact. Uh, but the first week was about rhythm guitar and um, the chords that you need to know, the voicings that, you, that are very common to playing blues, the, the basic rhythm patterns that you need to know to be able to play good blues rhythm guitar, because you have to know what to play when you're not playing a solo. If you're jamming with your friends and somebody else is taking a solo, well, you gotta back that person up and you've gotta be able to play rhythm. So I think we went through a lot of the appropriate parts that you would need to know. Um, some people might call them the stock parts, and, it's, and, and in a manner of speaking, they are uh, the very stock parts that make up rhythm guitar. But if you're, if you're a student of music and blues and blues guitar, um, and you pay close attention to the records, then you hear the parts that I taught and you heard how they can be embellished, which is what I also did that first week. So we talked about that. Uh, the following week we got into some, a little bit more about chord voicings that are common to playing blues, uh, most notably dominant chords, ninth chords, um, how to voice them, uh, where they sit on the guitar, how to recognize them, things in root position, uh, things in first inversion, things like that. Uh, then we slowly started to walk our way into uh, uh, a, a tool that you need to know, which is turnarounds. Um, and a turnaround is, is a phrase that you play at the end of a 12 bar cycle that basically lets everybody know you're going back up to the top of the progression or you're ending it and this would be this would be a turnaround or 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 those are turnarounds so I talked about those where they come from what they're built on um, the guitar players who, who were favored each one of those turnarounds, everybody from Robert Johnson to B.B. King to Muddy Waters. And after that we started to get into the idea of soloing and what makes a good solo. And before we got into the, the talk and discussion of scales, I brought up the fact that um, arpeggios are very crucial to being a good soloist. Um, and as I've said many times to my, my friends here at Jam Play who come to my Q&A and my students at Musicians Institute in Hollywood, they all, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've ever heard, well, you know, I, I know all my pentatonic patterns that I'm playing, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bored with what I'm doing. And the first words out of my mouth are always, well, do you know your arpeggios? And nine times out of ten they say no. And I say, well, here, then learn this and show them show them a dominant seventh arpeggio and how it links up with a pentatonic scale, minor or major. And all of a sudden people have an aha moment. Um, so we got into the idea of, of uh, arpeggios, dominant seventh arpeggios and how they work. And then uh, to further that, the following week we started to look at, went over our, our just to, to um, uh, review the pentatonic system we went through our minor pentatonic scale that we use for playing blues and the major pentatonic scale and the arpeggios and, and we saw just how they sit 
That would be your G7 arpeggio root position. Now here's G minor pentatonic root position. So we talked about doing a, uh, doing an exercise to get more familiar with seeing those notes right next to and on top of each other by doing going up the arpeggio coming down with the minor pentatonic and what this does is this helps us to identify the differences between the arpeggio and the pentatonic scale, the minor pentatonic scale so we talked about that, um, then we started to get into some very classic phrases that, that um, uh, you know, some of my favorite guitar players too, everybody from B.B. King to Albert King and Otis Rush. Um, we discussed that and, and things of those na tho that nature, and I thought that uh, this week would be a good time to sort of break away from uh, what we've been doing, which is basically playing to a shuffle or a slow blues 12-8 kind of feel. And um, I thought we'd do something, kind of make a left turn today. It's still the blues, we're still playing the blues, there's no doubt about it, you're gonna hear blues changes, you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear a 12-bar blues. But what we're gonna look at playing over that 12-bar blues is gonna be a bit different than what we've looked at for the last nine weeks. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about uh, a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's the idea of substitutions, or superimposing. And this is an idea that comes from jazz, you know, a, a, a back, in the, back in the late 50s, early 60s, when Miles Davis and John Coltrane and, and Thelonious Monk were reinventing jazz uh, and they came up with this idea of modal jazz. And um, they also came up with the idea of superimposing different scales and different chords over, over the chord that they're playing. That's the, where the term super, superimposing or superimposition comes from. Well, one of the things that they discovered was that you could also do this within the world of pentatonics it makes complete sense if you could apply the modes to, su to suspend it to um, um, superimposing, you know, superimposing a modal scale. You could certainly uh, apply or, or applying a chord, uh, superimposing one chord over another, and in the case of the blues, they might take like a G9, but somebody might be thinking D minor seven. And, and, and you might ask yourself, gee, that sounds kind of funny. Well, it sounds kind of funny till you get used to it, till your ear becomes accustomed to, to um, the intervals that are not present in the ninth chord that you're bringing out in that minor chord. And, um, and it's a really, a, 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 it's a very seductive sound when you, when you, when you get into it. I became aware of it listening to uh, Wes Montgomery and um, noticing there's a, a very famous blues that he did called, called um, Blues in D. Um, and uh, it's a 12-bar blues with a 2-5 turnaround in it, which is what we're going to be doing today. It's not going to be in the key of D. We're going to be playing in the key of G today. But this blues has a 2-5 change in it. And, um, but the thing that I noticed on this, this blues that Wes did, it's in D, and the second chorus that he plays, he does this. I was paraphrasing, that. there were a couple of notes that weren't there, but he's basically playing this phrase that comes out of A minor 7. that I, my ears really perked up to the sound of that and then 
as I started to learn more and study more and, 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 and learned that there was a whole um, there was a whole world of things that things started being getting hearing uh, that had to do with substitutions. Um, you're going to hear this in the language of jazz. You know, we do this with the melodic minor scale, with the harmonic minor scale, um, and uh, many great jazz players have utilized the idea of pentatonics, which is really just a five-note scale. That's what a pentatonic scale. And if you were to ask somebody, well, how many pentatonic scales are? Well, there's as many pentatonic scales as you can think of five-note combinations that make sense against a chord. So there's basically an infinite number, practically an infinite number of, of, of pentatonic scales that you could do. But uh, that said, um, we're going to look at what they did with taking the idea of the minor pentatonic scale. And since I said we're playing in the key of G today, well, there's G minor pentatonic. Well, you can not only play G minor pentatonic over, over G7, but you can play D minor pentatonic. So play E minor pentatonic, which is the relative minor of G. So that sound, maybe you've heard that sound. Jazz players have been utilizing it for years of taking the, 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 the relative minor, and they may not, a lot of guys won't think of it as, as E minor pentatonic, they're just thinking E minor 7. And if I was just to play E minor 7 over there, it still sounds, you know, it, it basically sounds the same, because it is the same. with a few chromatic flourishes thrown in, now you've got something that's approaching more of a jazzy kind of sound. basically play a 12 bar blues all the way through from measure 1 to measure 12 and I played over a 2-5 change and that 2-5 that we're adding is A minor 7 to D9 and I'm going to go through a couple of different ways that you can play through that other than what's on the example on the tab that's written here. Um, so, to recap for a second, uh, we're talking about substitutions. So, what I'm going to do first, before we go through the transcription of a blues in G, in G major, I'm going to play along to a track, and I'm going to, before I play, it's a track in minor. It's a blues in G minor. And I'm basically going to play nothing but substitution. I'm going to play a little bit of G minor pentatonic, but I'm going to do my best to avoid it. And it's a 12 bar blues, G minor, C minor, with D sharp, uh, D sharp 7, D7, and G minor 7. So it's basically a blues in G minor. So to get your ears used to the sound of what I'm going to play, I'm going to play over these over these minor chords to show you exactly what it sounds like. So I'm not going to play a lot. I'm just going to play a couple of choruses. 
but here's a blues and gene layer. Now the first thing I'm going to play here is A minor pentatonic. Now I'm going to play C minor pentatonic. Now I'm going to play D minor pentatonic. I'm going to play G minor pentatonic. Now I'm going to start out playing D minor pentatonic. talking about here and how how this stuff works and this is this is if you're not a beginner I mean obviously this is stuff that's not for beginners oh and by the way if you have any questions please type them in they'll be relayed to me and I'll be glad to answer your questions as best as I can um, if you're not a beginner, if you've been playing for a little bit, a little while, and you know you're looking to expand your harmonic horizons, so to speak, uh, and sort of ease into things, you know, not 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 quite jumping in with into the deep end, but kind of slowly going towards that deeper water of music. This is a great place to start. This is a great thing to start with because. What it does um, is it it gets your ears used to a different sound, something that you, you haven't been paying, maybe you haven't been paying attention to. Um, I can say that because I wasn't, you know. I mean, it wasn't until I started to really take listening to jazz seriously and that it, it wasn't until it really caught my ear that I started to understand, wait, wait a minute, there's something very familiar about that. Well, that familiarness was obviously the blues. And only you hear how jazz musicians have a slightly different way of looking at the blues and interpreting it and playing it. But the blues is the blues. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're dealing with that flat five, you're playing with it, you're playing the flat third, you're using the major third and the flat third and the flat five. You're, you're dealing in, you're in blues territory right now. So this is a great way to, to start to familiarize yourself with the sound of blues that is slightly askewed from the traditional sound of blues. So if you want to put up the... Uh, the tab, Chris, uh, you see we have a blues in G. Now we've got a 12 bar blues here, and I'm, you know, uh, those of you that know me, been, been, you know, you come to my Q&A or you've seen me here at Jam Play or whatever, um, 
you know, I try not to play the same thing twice, so it's hard for, you know, you know, this is a solo, I, I, I played it, I listened to it, I went, yeah, that's it, and that's basically, um, it's all basic, mostly based around the idea of playing off of E minor pentatonic instead of G minor pentatonic. Now there is, there's some G minor pentatonic that's attached in here um, in a bunch of these phrases, but for the most part, what I tried to do was center this bit of blues around the idea of, I'm not gonna play G minor pentatonic, I'm going to think more along the lines of E minor pentatonic. Along with this, what I did was I've done a track that is not a shuffle, and it's not a, it's not a twelve, it's not a slow twelve eight, and it's not a shuffle. It's a funky blues because all God's children got to get funky every once in a while, and I love to play funk, and I love to play the funk. So this is a you're going to hear it's a funky track. You know, not too fast. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a moderate tempo. And it's just a blues, a funky blues in G, but when it gets to the turnaround, at measure 9, we've got A minor 7, and then D9 to G7. So instead of just going 1, 4, 5, I put a 2, 5 in there. And you're going to hear at bar number uh, 9, if you go to that second page of the tab, you're going to see A minor, A minor 7. Actually, I did play A, a D7 flat 9. But you can play D9. Uh, actually, it's a flat 9 13. Natural 13. That's the chord. You're going to hear... It's still a 2-5, it's still, you know, it, it, it says D7 and then in parentheses is a flat 9. You can still treat it as, as, you can still think of it as a D7 chord. D7 flat 9 is also a diminished chord, depending on how it's voiced, what you're playing, blah, 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 blah. That's theory. Anyway, you're going to hear me play this phrase on the A minor 7. <laughs> centered around that. Now all I did was just take the same phrase and the same notes up a half step. So over A minor 7 I was thinking E minor pentatonic. And then when I got to the 5 chord I was thinking F minor pentatonic because the substitution over that flat 9 13 chord is an F minor pentatonic. So if you if you if you're keeping score at home and you want to write these down before I before I go any further, I'm gonna, I'm going to tell you explain to you somewhat of what the formula is that we look at. Over a minor chord, you can play off the fifth degree of the chord. Well, let me change that. Over a minor chord, you can play off the root. So as soon as we've got A minor 7 here, you can play A minor pentatonic for that whole measure and be correct. Now also over that A minor 7, you could play a fifth away from A minor. Now a fifth away from A minor is E. So you could play E minor pentatonic over A minor 7. You could also play off the second degree and a second away from A minor 7th is B. So you could play B minor pentatonic over A minor 7. Kind of, kind of. Some people think of it as Dorian. It's not Dorian. It's pentatonic, but it has a Dorian sound to it because you're playing the ninth in there. Um, then when we get to the five chord, the D7 flat nine, 
we've got some options. You could also play, obviously you could play G minor pentatonic over that because that's the five of G, so G minor pentatonic is gonna work. You could also play off the root, which would be D, so you could play D minor pentatonic if you were so inclined. Now if you wanna get a little more abstract with it, you could do what I did, uh, what I'm gonna play in this example, which is I'm gonna play F minor pentatonic, which is the flat third of D7. So a flat third away from the root is the pentatonic that you can employ. So since you got there's F minor pentatonic. Or you could also play off the flat seven. And the flat seven of D of D seven flat nine is C minor pentatonic. some interesting combinations there and what you may want to do what I tell people to do to practice them is like you know if you can make a loop of the chord this is what I did back in the day is I would just record myself playing that chord for five minutes you know the same chord find a groove and just keep playing that scale and play in and out of the scale pick a couple of notes pick two or three notes and 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 let your ear get a tune to the sound of these intervals because they're certainly if you've been playing a lot of straight ahead blues then these intervals are going to sound kind of foreign to you they're going to be in the they're, they're going to sound in the abstract but what I've always found what I've continually found with my students with people here at Jam Play and my, my students at school and my, my Skype people um, what I've continually found is somebody somebody will always go, ooh, I hate that sound, no, I don't like the way that sounds, oh, that's too weird. And then they live with it for an hour or a day and inevitably they come back to me and they go, you know, I, I, I kind of like that sound now. Because they've become, your ears have become adjusted to something that may seem dissonant to you. And, and what, what's basically happened is you've embraced the sound of dissonance. But it's not really dissonant. It doesn't really sound dissonant anymore. You know, when I discovered, you know, when I learned, I saw that I could resolve. Um, I could resolve right to the third of G, and all of a sudden, I went from a. something that had resolution and it related to the chord. I hope you think this stuff is pretty cool. Um, I do. And um, uh, so like I said, let's let's take a look at a couple of these phrases here. Um, this opening phrase at bar number one. Uh, <laughs> Now that's kind of a little chromatic thing that I'm doing on the third string from the tenth to the eighth to the ninth because I'm really doing a chromatic approach thing to that E. Right? when I'm playing over that G7 chord. Those are the tones that I'm featuring. There's the chord. And then I'm walking down to the root. On the second bar, 
of the blues. I'm doing that little. Now, what I see there could be looked at as D minor pentatonic. You could see it in there. And I'm lining up on the third of G. So there's my first phrase. Now the rest of it, and when I get down to, um, uh, if we come down to the four chord, uh, you're going to see, uh, got to stop saying ah, uh, you're going to see a blues phrase. You're going to see hear something that sounds very bluesy. Is it pentat? What is it? Is it in the pentatonic? It's all of it. It's it's just a blues. It's a blues phrase. That's what I'm doing. So what do we got here? We've got. Um, Actually, it's uh, it's it's in that area. So that's the area. If you you look at the notes and you see the tonality, that's what I'm playing. A lot of there's some chromaticism going on in there, but I'm keeping it all relatively tight here around this G9. What have I got around that G9? Well, I got D minor, I got E minor. So by not bending a note, you get a pure note, which could sound like it's sort of on the outside outskirts of the chord. And if I bend that note, well now it starts to sound like it could be in the pentatonic and it's in the blues. See what I mean? So when you start to break it down and analyze it like this, you start to see, well, there's more to playing blues than meets the eye. So let's take a look up, uh, let's move ahead to uh, what would be measure 9, bar 9, A minor 7, and this is where I start to really just emphasize kind of the mid-range part of E minor pentatonic, and when I say the mid-range part I mean that I'm really thinking up here. <laughs> in between the fourth string, the third string, and the second string. Um, what do we got here? We got... Um, that's the first couple of notes. And that's all E minor pentatonic. do something that's like that where I'm literally just taking the same phrase and moving it up a half step and going from E minor pentatonic which is the fifth of A to F minor pentatonic which is the flat third of D. Now I'm going to resolve out of it back to the one chord. And the big trick and the big challenge is learning how to play this stuff and resolve properly. And when I say properly, I don't, I don't mean that there's a right way to resolve, but you resolve in a way that makes sense melodically to the chord that you're resolving to. And in this, in this case, I'm going... So by just by going up chromatically from E to F, to G. We have We 
have a chromatic movement which certainly has a lot to do with jazz and it just has more to do with addressing the chords in a manner that you hadn't you probably had never thought of doing before. Now we're going to skip ahead to uh, what's in the next chorus. In, 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 the ne I, in the next chorus, the only um, part that I really want you to pay, there's, I, it's only the 2-5 part. The turnaround is the only thing that's notated here. And I'm going to do this riff that's based... <laughs> which is kind of a mouthful, and it's also, um, I'm also thinking of people like Cannonball Adderley when I play this. I'm thinking more of John Coltrane. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more about Miles Davis when I play that. And I did a, uh, you'll see, uh, a 16th note triplet which is what I'm doing which is done with pull-offs boy my chops are up today because it, it, <laughs> I'm working on this stuff so um, that's what I'm doing and, and, I'm, and that riff that I'm playing there at it carefully I'm really coming right out of E minor pentatonic there's F minor pentatonic now I'm coming out of it to resolve to the G with that little same little chromatic burst that I did to start the first 12 bars going A flat to, to G flat to G, or G sharp to F sharp to G. Now I'm doing some of those 16th note triplets in pull-offs to resolve. Now the part about rhythm is this. By using those sixteenth note triplets, those those pull-offs, you're being more rhythmic. You're 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 playing more. You're playing more inside the groove. You're thinking more about that funkiness that I'm going to play along to right now. So I'm going to do my best to basically play within the confines that I set myself up for, which was playing inside E minor pentatonic. And that's how I'm going to keep it. That's how I'm going to keep it phrased. I have to find the track here. I know it's here someplace. Here we go. So I'm going to let it kick off and let you uh, hear it, so you can kind of get focused on the groove and hear what I'm playing along to and just get the feel of it. It's a funk thing. It's it's a funky blue. I'm going to play a little rhythm in the front just to along with the other rhythm guitar that's on there just to just to give it a little bit more of that stinky sound as we like to say. So check it out. Here we go. Here's some funky blues in G.
called D minor pentatonic. Now I'm playing over that C chord. tried to call things out as I was doing them so you could get a sense of where I was and what I was thinking of but that's this like I said um, I think that this is a great way to introduce yourself to the to this idea of expanding your horizons if you're at that point in your playing where you want to get a little bit more lean, have something that leans a little bit more towards the sound of of, of jazz with blues. This is this is really a great place to start with it. It's not, um, you know, there, there's there, there are many different schools of thought about how to go about it. You know. Um, I see a question here. Are there patterns to what substitutions that I use? The substitutions are when you, I'm not sure what you mean by are there patterns to the substitutions. No, there's no pattern to the substitutions. It's the substitution. The substitution is this. If you look at the substitution as theory, well, what is theory? Theory tells us why things work and in the confines of the music we're playing. So in terms of playing blues and in the terms of, of, of what 
in, in some places we call this pentatonic theory and there are books written about pentatonic theory so it is called pentatonic theory um, it's not patterns that we use it's um, it's it's thinking out it's thinking within the confines of that scale if you want to hear a great jazz player one, one of the great jazz saxophonists of all time who, who was known for for utilizing pentatonics like that was was a guy named Joe Henderson uh, fantastic jazz saxophonist um, and you'll hear him doing some of this stuff um, but are there patterns no I'm, I'm, I'm playing you know when I uh, when I said I was gonna play um, when I said I was gonna play E minor pentatonic over A minor 7 I'm not really, I, you know, you didn't hear me play the scale. I'm thinking about E minor pentatonic. I'm thinking about E minor pentatonic, and I'm playing, what am I playing? I'm playing B, D, E, and G. So those are the notes. Those notes happen to be in E minor pentatonic, and broke it down and looked at, well, how do they relate to G7? Well, B is the third, D is the fifth, E is the sixth, there's G, which is the root. Or how do they relate to A minor 7? Well, B is the ninth, or the second, D is the, se D is the fourth, E is the fifth, and G is the seventh. So that's how we arrive at that. Um, what model year of Gibson is this? This is a 335. This is a Gibson 335. Um, it was made in the now defunct and closed Memphis factory, where I believe they were making the 335, the Les Paul, and I think they made the 175, which is a jazz guitar, and I think they made the Super 400 there, which is another jazz model. But, uh, and uh, my pickups are Gibson MHS, which they don't make anymore, because they, uh, to my knowledge, they're not making them. They only made them at the Memphis plant, and what they are is they are PAFs. They are, they're exact, they are PAFs, they can't call them PAFs, because um, after DiMarzio back in the 70s came out with their PAF model. So they call these the MHS pickups, which are basically like 1959 PA Gibson PAF. That's why this thing sounds. Sounds the way it does. Thank you for asking, by the way. I'll, I'll assume that you're uh, you're digging the sound of my guitar. All I'm playing through today, all I have is this guitar, this guitar cable, and my deluxe reverb amp. That's all I'm playing out of today. No overdrive, no nothing. I wanted to, I wanted to give all of you a, a pure sound to listen to, to hear, to hear these kinds of substitutions now. You know, if you're curious about who, where you can go to hear people doing some of this stuff, probably one of the greatest guitar players in the world, um, who's known for was known for certainly grabbing onto this stuff, was Larry Carlton, the the great L.A. session musician, played you know on all the the, the greatest Steely Dan records, um, you know, uh, if you've ever heard the Royal Scam, you're going to hear him on. Uh, uh, I believe that's him on Don't Take Me Alive. Yeah, that's him on Don't Take Me Alive. Um, which is basically like a blues. It's a Steely Dan kind of blues in A minor. And he does all of these. He, he basically does a lot of these. Um, uh, he does a lot of these kinds of, of substitutions in there. So that's a good place to go start to hear that stuff. And, um, you know, like I said, if you go into the world of jazz, you check out Joe Henderson you're going to hear him playing some of this stuff. So I hope you enjoyed, uh, I see we don't have any more questions here tonight. Um, 
Boy, I hope I didn't aggravate anybody. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you're curious about this stuff, you know, one a great way to practice it is to, if you've got a looper, set up a loop of a chord and just play over that chord for five, ten minutes until you're blue in the face playing all these kinds of substitutions and go back and reference the, the, the video recording of this so you can hear what I said about what to play when and where. And I think you're going to, and, and go have some fun with it and I think you're going to find, uh, you're going to find some new, fun, interesting things to play when you're playing the guitar and you're playing blues. And, and as I said nine weeks ago, everything that we're learning here is applicable to all, all styles of music. So, so what, we, what I did today certainly just doesn't relate to the world of blues. It, 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 you can play this stuff in rock, tunes, you know, anything, anything that you can, uh, you can groove to and it's got chords. You can certainly try and, and, and move some of this stuff into that territory. So that said, thanks for coming by today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I believe next week is our last week, week 10. And um, we may open the floor up to discussion. Um, if you've got questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, I'll probably have something to teach. Um, haven't just quite haven't just determined exactly what I'm going to do, but uh, that's what's up for next week. So I hope you enjoyed this week's lesson. Um, practice up. And um, I'll see you next week.